You are listening to Charting Wealth Weekly Review and Forecast for the week beginning Monday the 14th of March 2016. We always start with IYY. We then go through our other two market indexes. IYY is a total market fund. SPY is the S&P 500 and QQQ is the NASDAQ 100. We go through all three of those looking at the weekly and then the daily chart to see what happened over the course of the past week to give us some ideas to where the next week may go. We also then look at gold on both of the same charts, the weekly and the daily. Then we go through the news that moved the market this last week and what might be moving the market in the coming weeks. So stand by to recap what we did in the last week and look out for the things that might be affecting us this next week. Thank you so much for joining us. First, let's jump into IYY. That is the Total Market Index Fund. It's controlled by iShares, Dow Jones U.S. Total Market Index Fund. It is an ETF. What do we see going on? Well, we see that it crossed over on the week ending the 4th of March and actually has four up candles over the last four weeks, ending with another up candle. The market has not recovered from the highs it had in December and late November, but it has been moving up steadily the last four weeks, and we are in an up spurt at this time. We saw the market roll over at about the same time on our MACD, our moving average convergence divergence crossing the signal line, and at the same time the derivative oscillator flipping over. The things we talk about here on the podcasts, both both the daily and the weekly, You can find much more at our website, chartingwealth.com. Why we use the charts that we use, you can also get our How to Read a Stock Chart video along with the layout that we use at freestockcharts.com. All of that's for free if you sign up for our daily newsletter that includes the weekly review and forecast and all of our daily updates. And we have a daily update every day that the market is open to help you prepare and to see where we are on our three indexes and gold. So, We're in a crossover going up. Now we're going to revert back to our daily chart just to see what went, what happened over the course of the last week. And the week began, of course, on Monday the 7th. That was a bit of a down day, as was Tuesday. Then the market, what it really did throughout the course of the week, even starting on Monday, as it slid sideways, it had seen a high on Friday the 7th. And the market pretty much on the daily slid sideways throughout the course of the week and then popped up on Friday. The derivative oscillator went down until it leveled out on Friday between Thursday and Friday. We did see a divergence on Friday. Looked like we might actually have the MACD coming together to cross over the signal line to show us a down move, but that did not happen. Actually, they diverged a little further on Friday. That is the signal line and the MACD. That is where we were as far as the action went on the total market throughout the course of the last week. Now, let's go back to the weekly chart and look at the S&P 500 as depicted by SPY, which is run by Spiders. It's their S&P 500 Trust Series exchange traded fund. It, like the total market, has been up over the last four weeks, crossed over on the week ending on the 4th, March the 4th, crossed over on the MACD, as did the derivative oscillator, very similar to the total market, as depicted by IYY we just spoke about. Now, let's look at what happened on the S&P 500 throughout the course of the week again. For those of you who don't join us every week, it does not always look exactly the same as the total market. But don't forget, the S&P 500 are 500 of the big volume stocks in the market. So many times it looks the same, not always the same. In fact, on Friday, the total market was up 1.73%, S&P 500 up 1.6%. So they're not exactly in parallel, but many times on the big charts, they look somewhat similar. And the action we saw throughout the course of the week looked like a repeat of what happened in the total market. Now, we're going to take a look at the cues, which rarely, it sometimes looks somewhat similar to the other charts, but not nearly as closely aligned as we see with the IYY and the S&P. Uh, it has not yet crossed over going up on the weekly chart. It has flipped over on the derivative oscillator and looks like it is very close to crossing. It might have just crossed over at the end of the week, but until we see this next week's candle, we cannot confirm a crossover going up, but pretty close. Been going up for the last four weeks. 
And if we revert to our daily chart and take a look at what's going on on the queues, we can see that it had some strong down movement on Tuesday in particular, down movement on Monday, Tuesday, pretty much slid sideways Thursday and Friday, uh, Wednesday and Thursday, and then up big time on Friday, bouncing off the two-day chart. Derivative oscillator still in the positive, and of course, a more of a divergence uh, at the end of the week between the signal line and the MACD. That is where we are on all three of our indexes as you get ready to go into the next week. So please just be aware. It's the big charts that typically tell you where things have been going and where they are going because the big chart's like a big wave in the ocean. The bigger the wave, the more strength it has to keep moving in its direction. Now, enough of a, of a smaller wave, like if we saw the daily just trundle down hard, it would pull the big weekly wave over. But remember... The weekly chart, five times the size of the daily chart. So the market tends to keep moving in the direction of the initial inertia, which is shown to you by the big chart. So we're in confirmed up moves on the Qs. That is the NASDAQ 100, total market, and the S&P 500. And we see the week ending with a strong up move in all of those daily charts. So the market is in a is, is in an up move. That's where it's going to tend to go unless we have strong correctors. Okay, so keep that in mind. And we'll talk about some potentials for strong corrections or for strong continued movement when we get into the news after we finish up with gold. Now, let's jump into gold on the weekly chart. Gold crossed over on the weekly chart going up back on the 8th of January and has continued to go up since then. Huge week up on the week ending the 12th of February, and gold then sort of slid sideways for three weeks. It didn't really go above that high point, but what happened afterwards? Well, gold over the last two weeks has gone up even further. The derivative oscillator went up to its highest on the week ending the 4th, and then lost a little bit of energy over the course of the last week, but the MACD and the signal line are still very far apart, don't appear to be coming close together at all, and gold still has movement with the volatility bands, the Bollinger Band still has movement to keep going up. Now, let's take a look at gold on the daily chart. What do we see gold doing throughout the course of the week? Gold is in a confirmed down move on the daily chart. It's been quite interesting. It's primarily because the kind of indicator we like to use the most is very helpful. It's the MACD, the Moving Average Convergence Divergence, and it's very helpful when you've got a market that's actually moving. When you start having sideways slippage, as we've seen on the daily chart and the four-hour chart, the half-day chart, you end up not having a chart that helps you out a lot. And what's occurred on the daily is after gold had reached its peak back at uh, in February, on the 11th or so, it fell off and then slid sideways and stayed within a very close range. Well, gold ended up dropping over and has never had enough energy to actually get it up and above on the MACD. We do have the derivative oscillators now slipped into the negative and the MACD is in the negative on the daily chart. What happened throughout the course of the week on the daily chart? Well, on Monday, the 7th, gold was up as it was on Tuesday, and then gold sort of switched over with a big down day on Wednesday, up some on Thursday, and then a, a what we would call a spinning top, which means indecision and has not really found its way on the daily chart. What would you like to see that would make you feel good about gold continuing to move up strong? Well, that would be a nice crossover going up on the daily chart and a reversion in the red down box in the derivative oscillator. So gold is a bit schizophrenic down on the daily chart, up on the weekly chart, and just continue to watch. If you are in gold, hopefully you took some of your profits and you're being careful and watching as to what gold might be doing. That is where we have ended the week on gold. Now let's jump into sort of the news part. This is something we do only once a week, and it's only in our weekly review and forecast. We're going to talk about, because what do we say over and over? We say, pay attention to the charts, not to the media noise. The charts are actually your roadmap. All the other things are like the, the signs on the side of the road, uh, particularly uh, the 
advertisements, okay? That's what they're primarily doing is getting you to listen or read the news in order to see the advertisements and perhaps get yourself lulled into a false sense of security that things might be going the way you think they are without looking at the chart. Even if you are someone who is a value-based investor, if you're really into how the company is performing uh, on its metrics, that's wonderful, but you also need to see how the market and the economy is affecting it. The last thing you want to do is buy a good stock at a high, you know, when it's about ready to roll over or has already started in a down movement. What we try to help you do is learn how to read a stock chart so you buy at the right times, even if you're a value investor. So let's jump into what happened over the course of the week. Well, we saw uh, Mario Draghi, who's the president of the European Central Bank, he announced an aggressive package of additional measures which they hope will help the eurozone. He blunted his message uh, by suggesting that they will not, that is, they will not be moving rates further. And what happened was the euro reversed some initial losses following the announcement and then ended significantly higher than where it began on Thursday's session. Uh, the euro gave back some of those gains ahead of the weekend, but still into the week higher than it had prior to that ECB meeting. What else happened? Well, we saw market forces uh, working on things, production cuts. When we look at the United States and the slower ramp up in Iran's production helped stabilize oil prices. That was something that, uh, as far as the oil market was, they were very happy to see. We also saw, now this was interesting, the Bank for International Settlements put out the message that negative rates were possibly debilitating the banking sector, the persistently negative interest rates on profitability of the banking sector has emerged as an important consideration. That was a warning put out this past week by the Bank of International Settlements in a report that they issued. So insurance companies, pension plans and all can face serious challenges as far as the models that they are using due to what well, what you could call unorthodox, I would call it highly unorthodox up until recent history, monetary policy. So those are things to, uh, again, continue to pay attention to. Here's something that we need to pay attention to because we are going to have a Federal Reserve Board meeting this next week. We've had two members of the United States Federal Reserve Board speak out publicly offering different conclusions on inflation. We saw Vice Chair Stanley Fisher stating that inflation may be stirring. We saw Governor Brainerd saying that she felt that the Fed had, quote, put a high premium on clear evidence that inflation is moving higher. They're going to have to do that, rather, before they start tightening any monetary policy further. Now, again, most watchers of the Federal Reserve, and this does matter with us, they don't expect the Fed to increase rates uh, at this next open market meeting, which will be happening over the course of this next week. We'll get into that and other potential market moving news over the next week, but you want to pay attention to that if you are in the market during that meeting. That is always, almost always something to pay attention to, but it looks like it probably won't be as volatile as it would if they were going to increase interest rates. What's happening with uh, the European Central Bank? Oh, well, besides them doing their, their, their actions to try to deal with problems affecting the Eurozone. We also saw the Bank of New Zealand. They beat the ECB to the punch on Wednesday. They ended up cutting their rate to a low from 2.5% to 2.25%. Uh, we also saw the IMF warning that the world faces a growing risk of economic derailment and needs immediate action to boost demand. This is the IMF's uh, Deputy Director, David Lipton. And he said, quote, Now is the time to decisively support economic activity and put the global economy on a sounder footing. How's he going to do that? Well, with a three-pronged approach, with physical policies, uh, fiscal policies, making the most of monetary policy, and they want to try to push forward various structural reforms. Again, folks, Look at the world these days. Everything seems to be based on free money or negatively uh, <laughs> negative interest rates, which is something we've never tried before. And the more they tend to mess around with things, the crazier things get. What does that mean for the market, typically? 
the market goes higher and higher and higher the more that they make credit available and the cost of money cheaper. Of course that's what happens. When things do start tightening up, that's why you need to know how to read a stock chart so that you're able to get yourself out and also to capture profits in inverse funds. Uh, when the market starts crashing hard, you can of course rotate out into funds that go up when the market goes down. And again, Listen to all the different training that we have on chartingwealth.com. You'll learn so much more about that. Again, we're an education company. We're not a stock calling service, but we're happy to help you learn how to read a stock chart. So what do we have coming up over the course of this next week? Well, on Tuesday, we have a couple of things happening. The United States is going to release its retail sales data. You're going to also see the Bank of Japan holding a rate-setting meeting on Tuesday. Pay attention uh, to those things, and they're not going to be nearly as market impactful as the Federal Reserve Open Market Committee meeting on Wednesday. Everybody's going to be paying a lot of attention to that, so keep your ear out for that at least. And then on Thursday, the Bank of England is going to have their Monetary Policy Committee meeting. So those are the potential things, particularly that Wednesday Fed meeting. Pay attention to that. See just what comes out of it. Hopefully nothing. It's poised to not have any impact. So just keep watching it. Pay attention. Hopefully, if it has any impact at all, you'll see the market continue to go up. The last thing the Fed wants to do is start putting out negative things with the shaky international economy. So again, that looks like where we are and where we're going. And again, pay attention to the charts. Every day, listen to our podcast, which you can get for free emailed to you every day by just going to chartingwealth.com. We so appreciate you. If you have questions, concerns, problems, issues, please let us hear from you. Just email us from the website. You can always follow us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, YouTube. We're here for you. We love to hear from you. Thank you so much from chartingwealth.com.